It's at the end of the old Silk Road. There's romance in that name. But behind this dull-looking doorway in Srinagar, there's much more romance. The story of a thread of silk. It begins with the private life of the silkworm. And what an exotic life the silkworm has. Take, for an instance, its diet. The only thing that it will even look at is mulberry leaves, and then only this specially grown variety. But they've got no table manners to speak of, and when they get their food, they gorge it without stopping for several days. Then, like the ancient Romans, having eaten as much as they can hold, they purge themselves until they grow translucent. Then they're mounted on twigs and kept in warmish rooms, where they spin for themselves a luxury bedchamber of silk, their cocoons. After a few days, the ready cocoons are moved from their supports. How does a strong and lovely thing like a thread of silk come out of an ugly thing like a worm? We don't know. All we do know is that the little worm needs a house to hide in while it changes into a chrysalis. And that house is made of silk, a house that it makes in under a week. Even the outer layers of the house, the mere fluff on the outside is worth collecting because it makes a soft stuffing for pillows and quilts. It's too short to spin, but nothing at all that the silkworm does is wasted by the men who breed and feed it. Talking of breeding, here's a machine which separates the males from the females. The females are heavier than the males, so everyone over three grams goes into one slot and everyone under three grams goes into another slot. Then everything is nice and tidy. Males in the lowest box, females in the next, and... What's that? Next, the cocoons are threaded into long garlands to make it easier for the live chrysalis to emerge as a moth. And at this stage, the breeders are as respectable as boarding house landladies. Male and female garlands are kept strictly apart. There are many ways of doing it. Here's another. And here is what the worm becomes in his house of silk. Now the worm has wings. And here is a sort of aircraft factory where those wings are made, except that here nature does the work while men wait to snatch the benefits. Here are the male moths, all of a flutter. Why? Here's the answer. A handful of females, big, pretty and lazy. Everybody likes pictures of weddings. Well, here's a mass ceremony. And here the bridegrooms are being introduced to the blushing brides. It's a compulsory marriage, and if the happy pair were given a copy of Mein Kampf, it would be just like Hitler's Germany. In fact, so like it that the defective males and females are even sorted out and destroyed. And here's a romantic sidelight on the silkworm's private life. During the time they mate, they eat nothing. They live, say the breeders, on love and air. But here the honeymoon is rudely interrupted. The females are snatched away and shut up in bags to breed. And as for the males, they're thrown into the dustbin. And that's something that many wives have thought of but dared not say. The female moth lays anything from 400 to 500 eggs in these little sacks of paper and muslin which are attached to wooden frames and kept in a sort of incubating chamber. When she's laid her eggs, the female dies, and that's the end of the private life of the silkworm. There's a post-mortem to be held. Every single moth of the millions that are kept in this institute is examined to see whether it's diseased or healthy. If it's diseased, the eggs are scrapped to stop the spread of the infection. The female moths are ground in water to make a solution of their contents, and the juice of six moths at a time is examined under a microscope on a single slide. Hundreds of workers using hundreds of microscopes conduct this post-mortem and it takes sometimes six months to examine the millions of insects to make sure that every moth has got its health certificate and that India's silk industry is kept free from disease. And now the eggs are ready to be sent out to farmers all over the country. They're poured into little flat boxes, each of which contains one ounce of seed eggs. This is the result. 50,000 villagers take the government eggs, rear their own silkworms, and when the worm has made its house of silk, they sell the cocoons back to the government at prices around 25 rupees for every morn. The story of silk is a strange one, but perhaps the strangest part of all is this. 
the private life of a worm laying the foundation for the livelihood of whole families, whole villages, and entire countryside. The worm is still alive inside the cocoon, and so it's carefully and gradually toasted to kill it. Overheating will spoil the silk thread. The worm sticks his house together with gum, so the thread is loosened by boiling. Each little worm spins a mile of thread in which to wrap itself up. Too fine to handle singly, 10 or 11 of these threads are taken together and spun off from the cocoon. That's the best thread. There's a certain amount of waste, which is collected and dried in the sun. It's called waste, but it'll make a perfectly good shirt. Back to the reeling machine, where the fine quality silk is threaded off the cocoons and spun together, until it becomes something that looks like moonlight made solid. But the worm has still a part of its coffin left to it. It's like a shell of paper. It's boiled in vats, until this crawling, ugly looking sponge is produced. It's an unpleasant mess of dead worms and boiled casing. The dead worms go for manure and for feeding birds, and the rest goes to make, of all things in the world, velvet. The pure silk thread from the cocoon goes on to be made up into hanks and skeins. The thread is cleaned and combed, and the ends tied together to make the familiar shape in which silk is bought and sold in the shops. From a miracle of gossamer, it's become a commonplace, a commercial product that's weighed and checked like a pound of potatoes. Each of these packages contains five pounds of silk and is worth some 200 rupees a piece. The processes are now the same as those they use in weaving cotton. There's the same spinning maze of bobbins and flying shuttles blending the delicate threads into the warp and woof of the toughest cloth that can be made. But this cloth is not meant to flatter the vanity of a woman or to deck out the pretensions of an aristocrat. It's going to serve a grimmer purpose. Silk has gone to war. This is the beginning of a parachute. The silk, a parachute made entirely of silk, is boiled to bring it to a perfect condition. Then, in this factory, somewhere in India, it's checked and stored ready for the parachute makers. And parachute making's a job which needs pin-sharp efficiency. This man is sewing up holes, one tiny hole, and the wind will rip it into a gash that will send a pilot hurtling to his death. Next, cutting the silk with a skilled hand guiding a fast-cutting machine double sewing. A parachute opens in one second. One bad stitch in that one second and the parachute will become a useless, murderous bundle of rags. Next, testing the ropes. The pilot doesn't just drift down to earth, he can steer himself in some small degree by tugging at these ropes and by these he can break the jolt of his landing. Next, the folding. The parachute doesn't open of its own accord, it's blown open by a gale from the slipstream of the airplane and that's often blowing at 200 miles an hour. These folds are calculated to behave properly in that vital second as the pilot leaves the plane. There are yards of rope and no time to stop and unravel a carelessly tied knot. Knowing the ropes is a matter of life and death in these men's hands. The chute is rolled into a package and now it's ready for the flying man. They know that should anything happen to them in the air, there's nothing between them and certain death but the folded sheet of silk that makes their cushion. The lives of the men who are drifting down to battle, the fortunes of nations at war hang by a thread. A thread spun by a little worm with a liking for mulberry leaves.
and a passion for the privacy of its own little house of silk.